Okay, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Matt Miller, proud superintendent of Lakota Local Schools. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I know there are so, there's so much going on um, with school with certainly this time of year, um, but I sincerely want to thank you for giving up about 45 minutes of your time tonight. Um, certainly, I wish we were all in person. That's usually how our annual State of the Schools addresses go. Um, and that way we can feature more people, but I am excited about the panel uh, that we're bringing in tonight to talk to, to me, to all of you, to share a little bit about uh, this very unique, most unique school year we've ever had. Um, and, and that being said, I sincerely want to thank our teachers, our staff, our administrators, our school nurses um, for all the work that's taking place um, in our schools whether it's through VLO or in person, um, we know that this is very challenging on all of us. All the, the stresses I think that we normally have in a school year is certainly compounded um, by everything that we're dealing with with COVID. Um, but I just want to give a, just to start off with giving a thanks to everybody for hanging in there and trying to make this as successful and as meaningful for our kids. Um, tonight, um, we are blessed with, uh, with a panel of, of teachers, a, a guidance counselor, to students, some central office people to talk a little bit about where we're at and, and where we're going and how things are from their perspective. Um, but I do want to start out showing a, a brief video. It's a three minute video um, that we're going to showcase talking about um, this school year and some of the things that we've been working on. One of our biggest challenges is how do we how do we do school? How do we do the the, the work of education in the midst of a pandemic? Um, a lot of schools like Lakota hadn't seen our kids in almost six months, and so we wanted to put our eyes on our kids and build those relationships between our staff members, our teachers, and our students, which is really important. Families have been great. They've been graceful. They've been flexible. Our teachers have uh, recreated themselves. Uh, much of our staff feels like it's first year of teaching again. I think on a lot of levels, I feel like it's my first year as a principal again. I took being able to like sit next to my friends at lunch, being able to like give people hugs, I took everything for granted. We can't have the students close together this year, so that's been a challenge, but I would say this is a very happy place, and the kids have been very happy to be back in the classroom face-to-face -face learning. Our, our kids have been pretty resilient. Education is important, obviously, and we want that to be the main focus, but there are things that we have to do differently this school year that they're not used to. It's not a hard change. It's definitely a learning curve. On the drop of a dime, <laughs> we can switch, and we can be flexible, and we are strong. I think the number one thing is we want our kids to feel safe and loved and understand that the teaching and learning still happens whether we have this mask on or not. I see kids finding ways to make it work. I see staff members finding ways to make it work from beyond six feet, from using technology. These are skills that are gonna benefit them that they might not even have gotten if we didn't have to go through this. My biggest challenge is, as anybody that knows me, I am definitely a face-to-face, hands-on, they're elbow hugs right now, but I love to give bug hugs. I mean, it's so cool how we're all learning this together. A lot of my friends are doing virtual learning and I haven't seen them in probably six months. And I try to reach out to them and ask how they're doing. We're always trying to, again, learn everybody's names and making everyone feel welcome and making class still feel like a community and fun even. Social emotional learning is just as important as academic learning. And it's probably right now uh, even more important. Biggs is now our fourth therapy dog here at Lakota that help out with, with calming some anxiety and providing just that little calming sense of nature for um, what some of our kids and some of our staff members need. So we're very blessed. Something that has just been taught over and over again through Lakota is get it done. There's always a way, don't stop. I think anytime you have an opportunity to, to go through struggles, it's going to make you stronger if you allow it to. We thought it was going to be hard, but our kids are rocking it. Let's, um, let's go ahead and, and meet tonight's panel, and I'll be uh, introducing them now. First, I want to start off with Mr. Keith Coney, the Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, Mr. Elgin Card, 
our Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Ms. Katie Bauer, who's in-person and VLO teacher, and she's at Ridge Junior School. Uh, Mrs. Jama Singh, VLO teacher from Cherokee Elementary. Mrs. Audrey Young, who's a counselor from Freedom Elementary. Theo Angle, sophomore VLO student from Lakota East. And last and certainly not least, Destiny Jackson, senior student attending school in person at Lakota West. And so um, huge shout out to, to the panel. Thank you all for being here and for giving up your time and sharing uh, your story with, with the audience. And so uh, before we get into some of the questions, um, I think it's, it's important just to remember a little bit about some of the decision points that we made as a school district um, very early on. So uh, we've been dealing, obviously, with this for the better part of a, of a year, and certainly we are rolling into uh, the holiday break. Uh, the district was very um, methodical in making the decision that we wanted to come back in person as much as possible, but also give our families and our students and our staff an option for virtual learning as well, because we know that um, different situations arise in families, and we have different thoughts and feels about COVID and how long we've been dealing with this and, and how long we will be dealing with it. I think too, there's um, a key piece and, and Audrey's gonna uh, hit on this a little bit later about the social emotional needs of our students, whether it's in person or VLO, that's a huge um, concern, worry, thought for all of us as we're all trying to figure this out. And we know that um, schools are um, not unique in our concerns and worries for our students, for our families, for our staff. Um, we know that um, other people are struggling as well. And so uh, we know we are not on an island on any of this and that um, we are one part of the community that's been, um, you know, really, really trying to deal with this the best way that we can. Uh, we have tried to put in some uh, safety guidelines that we continue to work on almost a, on an everyday basis as we try to limit exposure of our kids so that when we see an uptick, um, hopefully that comes that calms down a little bit. We've seen that at the Halloween slash election uh, days in at the end of October, beginning of November, certainly with Thanksgiving. Um, but we continue to work with Children's Hospital, with UC Health, with the Butler County Health Department, um, and we're following the new guidelines that the Butler County Health Department um, is adopting um, based on the guidance from the Ohio Department of Health and the CDC, uh, 10 days for quarantine instead of 14, or seven days if you have a negative test. Um, and we're also one of nine students, or excuse me, school districts that have been working with the um, COVID-19 um, Ohio State um, evaluation. And so that's carrying on through the end of this month. I also want to let people know just because of the platform of State of the Schools, it's a little bit different um, in terms of Q&A. So if you have a question you'd like us to, to hit, uh, that it, we'll answer that, but it'll be at a future event. But you can certainly put that in the chat box and we'll get it out either as an update as part of this uh, recording uh, moving forward. So we only have 45 minutes. We want to kind of focus on that. But again, if you have questions, put it in the chat box and we will answer them in a, a, a soon to be released um, update. So I wanna mention that as well. Um, I also wanna thank our staff, our community and our, and our students for um, their help in terms of the survey that we uh, have been working on going through the responses uh, that just closed Monday morning. So the executive team and some other administrators have been going through that now. And so we're reviewing those responses to the survey and making adjustments uh, to the beginning of the second semester when we come back after winter break. So that, that should be announced here uh, very soon in the next few days about um, other options uh, that we are considering based on the feedback that we got for everybody. So thanks for that. We take it and we're going through and there's obviously a lot of uh, feelings and extended responses. So we are trying to go through those uh, with a fine tooth comb now. Um, so I wanna mention that. Um, let's start off with the panel tonight, um, talking about 
the, um, the VLO. So, Mr. Coney, I'm going to start with you tonight, batting leadoff. Um, can you talk a little bit um, for us about, you know, how VLO was, was designed? Why was it important to have our own teachers build this out as opposed to, you know, using an outside group? So if you can give us your thoughts on, on that. Sure. Thanks, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, when we uh, started this back in the spring, we were committed to providing a virtual option for our students who needed, uh, needed that and could not attend school. And as we started to plan that out, we realized it was a pretty uh, daunting task. We had um, an unknown target, and we realized that we had to provide uh, curriculum for our teachers who might end up teaching uh, virtually like some of our teachers are uh, tonight. Uh, so we had to decide what kind of curriculum to use, and all districts went through the same process over the course of the summer. Everyone was trying to figure out how to provide something for their families who were having their kids learning at home. And some districts chose to um, purchase a curriculum off the shelf or something that they've used in other places. Uh, very few other districts decided to do what we did and uh, build our own curriculum with our own teachers. And it had always been a plan of ours to develop sort of a, a dynamic curriculum that we'd be able to build with our teachers over time. And this just sped up that process. And so we invested in our teachers uh, over the course of the summer and we built out uh, core content in all of our K-12 classes, uh, in our high schools, some of our electives. Uh, it was really important for our families to stay connected to Lakota and our teachers and our expectations and our pacing if they wanted to come back in, in person eventually. And our teachers are some of the best anywhere and did a fantastic job building out that content, especially in the K2, K3 level, where that direct instruction piece from the teachers is so important and seeing a, a teacher's face and explaining everything was really, was really critical. So that was, the, that was how we founded the VLO curriculum and decided to invest in our teachers building that out. We know it's not been an easy process and it's been a ton of work by our teachers and our families who are supporting that and our students. Uh, we're super thankful for that. Um, we've been trying to be, give grace to each other all the way through this process and learned along the way and we continue to learn. And it's been, uh, it's been a huge benefit for us and will continue to be a benefit because that curriculum will live there and those lessons will be there and Great teachers like uh, Mrs. Singh and Mrs. Bauer will continue to improve that over time. So we're excited about that. Keith, how do you explain to somebody the difference between VLO and what like remote learning was last spring? Sure. Well, the challenge with remote learning is that we were all thrown into that sort of uh, by circumstances and uh, families were at their, uh, were trying to figure that out on their own also. And so remote learning really is for a short term period and it is looks a little bit more like a traditional school day and uh, whereas a virtual classroom is more flexible. Um, students do have a schedule that they work through, but they have more freedom to be able to work on their own time um, at their own pacing, especially for teachers who are dedicated to the VLO. That flexibility is really important for them, allows them to personalize and individualize for those students on a more flexible time frame, So that's really important. What about, um, yeah, and, and, and I, I totally get that. And I, you know, this is a question that, you know, I could be asking myself, but I'm gonna ask you. Um, some of the challenges we've had um, this school year revolve around quarantine students. And so can you talk about maybe the progression of how we're trying to reach those kids that have been quarantined? Obviously now for most of our kids, they don't have to be quarantined as long, but sort of the, the process of that and what that looks like now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we, it's been an evolving situation. We've tried to learn along the way, like everybody has. Uh, originally, we had asked all of our teachers to make their classes sort of remotable so that they would be able to meet the needs of kids who are at home for uh, a two-week per time period. That became more difficult to do. And so we've tried to add in more direct instruction pieces and more um, Zooming opportunities or opportunities for teachers to meet with quarantine students. Um, and like I said, that's, a, that's an evolving process that we're still working our way through, but I think that that has, uh, we've learned a lot. The other nice thing is those model courses that all of our teachers developed over the summer are great resources for our teachers to be able to use. So obviously we're thrilled that the CDC guidelines have come back and allow our students to get in-person uh, quicker 
But I do think that we're coming up with more solutions for how to meet the needs of those kids when they're out of school. Yeah, totally agree. Thank you for that. And then, Keith, if, you know, obviously we're hopeful that we can stay in. Um, if the numbers spike and we do have to, to pull the plug, so to speak, and go to remote, how does remote look this year um, if we have to go down that road versus the way it was in the spring? Right. It's a constantly moving target. Right. Uh, we've learned We've learned a lot from last spring. We've, we've surveyed a lot from our parents and we look at those uh, thoroughly every time those come in. And we realized from our surveys from last spring that parents really appreciated the flexibility for their kids, but they needed a little bit more structure to be able to organize their kids' work at home. So we've been working since the beginning of the school year about remote learning 2.0 if we have to go that, that direction anytime. That's why we practiced that around the um, election day to be able to see what that looked like, gain some feedback from that, talk to our staff and our students about that. And it will be, it'll be more of a daily schedule if we have to go that direction, that our kids will be on, that they'll be able to see their teachers regularly, that they'll be able to feel more like a school day. Obviously that's gonna be challenging for um, working families or families with multiple, multiple kids. Um, older siblings who have to be watching younger siblings will be flexible around that as we work through that. Um, but all of our survey data has told us that our community is pretty supportive of what we've been able to do so far, and hopefully we'll be able to continue that for the rest of the school year. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Uh, Jamma Singh, I'm going to, I'm going to go to you now, um, as a VLO teacher. And I, I think one of the things that, you know, we talk about at school and, and you certainly have a very unique perspective on this now, um, is relationships and relationship building. And, you know, one, one of my concerns um, ha has been and, and continues to be is how do you how do you start, you know, essentially in a VLO? And, and this is not a great example, but uh, when we went to remote learning in the spring, it was a little bit easier because we all the teachers and educators and principals had relationships already established with the kids. So we went to remote. It wasn't ideal, but you, you knew who your teacher was. So how do you as a, a VLO teacher start a school year? Um, in that kind of setting? And how do you build relationships in that model, in a virtual model? Yeah. Well, first of all, I just have to say that the VLO students and the families have just been amazing this year. I think there's just been a high expectation on them and they've risen to that um, challenge. Um, they participate in both the synchronous learning through the Zoom sessions and also participate in asynchronous learning through the dis direct instruction videos. Um, and the families just have been incredible in supporting their child and partnering with all the VLO teachers this year. But I agree with you, successful schooling happens only through building that relationship. And I remember someone once telling me that um, students don't care how much you know, unless they know how much you care. And so when I think back to my own learning, I realize how true that is. And the best years that I've had as a student were uh, years when I had a relationship with my teacher. And so I knew that, um, you know, it's, it's very important to build that classroom community. And I had to ask myself, what am I going to do to build a strong relationship with students that I don't know yet um, through this virtual world? And I think that those strong relationships happen when um, students and teachers share a common bond and a common experience. And so the VLO teachers, uh, we spent the first weeks of school just getting to know one another in whole group and in small group sessions. Um, not only did we meet through Zoom to practice like academic skills, but to get to know each other and, and learn also social emotional skills. Uh, we listened to one another. We talked to each other about books and characters within stories that we could have empathy for. Um, we learned about each other and our unique qualities. Um, there's many VLO classes that do a lunch bunch in which students get together and um, during a typical lunchtime and just get, to get a chance to talk with one another. Um, one of the things that I've done also um, is we highlight someone for each of our Zoom sessions. Mm -hmm. So students get a chance to share all about me page. Um, they get a chance to ask questions um, to, about one another and they feel connected when they're also having fun. Um, so we do a lot of building community activities. We do virtual games. 
Um, Michael Halstead is a sixth grade teacher at Cherokee, and he engages his class by um, dressing up as a character substitute teacher every few weeks. And so one of his class favorites was when um, Brutus Buckeye showed up to lead the class meeting and he literally wore a Brutus Buckeye head on, on him. Um, Emily Welsh and Wendy St. John, they also have substitute teachers named Mr. Bob and Princess. And, um, you know, something else I thought is, is since we're doing school from home, why not include home in our schools? So, you know, one day for small group sessions, we had students bring real or stuffed animals to class to learn with them. Um, and it's kind of like having our own therapy animals with us. So there's a lot of fun things that you could do um, to build classroom community through the virtual setting. That's, um, that, that's great to hear. I mean, you, you, like you've said it a couple of times, you've kind of built your own community. It's just different um, than, than what we've been used to. So thanks for that. I guess, I guess that kind of like, how do you reinvent the classroom in a virtual setting? Because um, this is hard enough, but to do something um, this different. So can you, can you talk a little bit about like the highlights, so to speak, of a typical week in, in virtual learning? Sure, sure. So I knew this year would be nothing like I've experienced before. And I, I had to start out and just even ask myself, okay, what can I do with my students because I am virtually that I would not even be able to do really in person? Like what advantages do I have through Zoom? So I um, actually, I feel like I get to meet with my students more often through the VLO platform uh, because all of the direct instruction is through videos and asynchronous learning. So it's really a flipped classroom. And that has freed me up to spend a lot of my Zoom sessions and my day meetings and small groups to differentiate instruction and meet the needs of my students more. Um, and then I've also been able to use technology in lots of new ways. Uh, for example, I was working with my third graders on teaching elapsed time. And I got this idea from my teaching partner last year. So she would take her class to Disney World and they would plan out the day using elapsed time. And but because we're remote, we I literally got a chance to take them to Disney World. So we planned a day together of all the rides that we wanted to go on. We used our knowledge of elapsed time to get our fast passes and figure out our entire itinerary. And then through Zoom, I was able to find um, videos of actual Disney rides and we got to ride those rides together. So kids who had never been to Disney World before was able to say that they did. Um, and then students can also share their learning in different ways too. So we do lots of discussion through Google Open Documents, which would be hard to use in the classroom, through Canvas discussions. We often record ourselves through a Flipgrid, and then we share it out with one another, and they can respond through that. I've made videos of the class doing projects. Um, then we post it on our virtual classroom page. And then it's also been tr important to try and balance the screen time with the hands-on activities and projects too. Um, so like Alicia Bowman, she's a fifth grade VLO teacher. She was even dissecting owl pellets with her, her um, students at home. Um, so, and one of the perks too is that students and families can basically plan their own schedule for the day. That's kind of what Keith was talking about as well. So they could spend more time or less time on certain subjects and activities. And it's been fun to see students go beyond the expectations that would be laid out in the classroom when they become like pretty passionate about a topic or an idea. They almost seem to run with it. Um, for example, some science experiments have been conducted, have really blown me away this year. They've been very in-depth and engaging and a lot more than what I ever could have done in the classroom too. So um, one more thing too, uh, like on Thursdays, we do something called a thoroughly fun Thursday. And I try to align it with something that we're learning about. So um, even a couple of weeks ago, we were studying rocks and science and our class showed up for our Zoom session in their best rock and roll gear. And we brought our rocks and, you know, we're just having a lot of fun through VLO and, and um, it's, trans it's definitely different than the classroom, but it's been very, very positive. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for sharing all that. It's a lot, lot more than I, than I knew too. So um, I learned a lot. Let's, let's, let's shift a little bit um, and talk to one of our students that's in VLO, uh, Theo, Theo Angle. Can you um, talk 
uh, and tell the audience a little bit about uh, what virtual learning looks like um, from your perspective? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so what an average day looks like for me and my friends at VLO is pretty simple. Um, every every uh, Monday, the beginning of the week, um, each of my teachers pushes out um, their version of their agenda, or it's usually like a guide. Um, and what I do is I put it into my own agenda that I can use for the entire week. Um, and going into um, like the individual classes, I have two classes that um, operate in Apex. And uh, Apex is, um, it, it's, it's just another program similar to Canvas, except, you know, we get like, you know, 26 pages of a reading that we have to read and like get the material. And then there's, you know, graded quizzes that go count towards the grade. Um, and then my, the other classes that I have are held in Canvas and um, my teachers will, you know, either record their own videos or they'll give us plenty of material like YouTube links and such to, you know, learn the material. Got it. Thank you. And then I'm just curious, are you planning on sticking with VLO for the second semester? Uh, yeah, I chose to do VLO. Yes. Okay. Um, so in this sort of environment, you know, from, from the, from the student perspective, what do you think has, what's been the most challenging um, about VLO from your, from your perspective? Well, um, the biggest challenge I've had was just budgeting my own time because, you know, I'm all on my own the entire day and, you know, it's very easy to get sidetracked and do something else. So just, you know, budgeting your time and getting stuff in, you know, done in time and not getting behind. Um, but, you know, as far as the school aspect and the teachers, there hasn't been anything else that's been a challenge. That's good. What, do, what would you say is the, the main positive or the, the thing you like most about VLO? Yeah. So I think it was mentioned earlier, but it's really just the, you know, I can use my time, yep. you know, as you know, I, 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 I'm on, I'm on my own pace. You know, I can take things slow, take things fast. I usually take things fast because, you know, there's not, it's the same amount of material as if I was in class, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can kind of re read the material faster um, rather than the teacher explaining it. Do you think, um, I'm just curious too, um, you know, do you think that your your grades are the same um, in VLO versus when you were in person? Uh, yeah, I mean, as I, I think they're, you know, if anything, they're definitely a little, a little better than they were in person. But, you know, as far as the grades go, you know, in the work, it's like it all gets graded the same and, you know, you know. Good. I wasn't trying to throw a curveball. I was just curious if it yeah. was if it was about the same. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. We'll uh, we'll go now to uh, Mrs. Katie Bauer, who just as a reminder, she's at Ridge. Uh, very interesting perspective. Like like many of our other teachers, she has a foot in VLO and a foot in in person. Um, so Katie, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, how you see students thriving or being successful both in person? and in a VLO environment? Does it look different for each one? Is it the same? What, are you, what, what, are, what have you noticed? Absolutely, I'd love to. Um, this has always been one of my favorite parts of teaching is getting to see students thriving and experiencing success. And as you said, this year, it looks very different regardless if you're in person or VLO. So it's almost twice as impressive and twice as exciting to see students experiencing success because school does look different. Um, in regards to in-person students, the video at the beginning alluded to the fact that a lot of our in-person students um, clearly are really excited to be back to school, having been gone for almost six months. And on a daily basis, I see this. I see students who are truly excited to not only be at school, um, but also be learning alongside their peers. Um, the level of in intrinsic motivation that I see amongst my uh, students is just remarkable. It's been really cool to be a part of that. Uh, secondly, a typical school year comes with anxieties that students face uh, on the first day of school. Um, a new teacher, uh, a new building potentially, um, new peers around them. This year, uh, that was the same uh, with more um, 
anxieties that they would have experienced going in. Um, I can speak to seventh grade as I'm a seventh grade teacher. My students every single year are nervous on the first day about their lockers and um, trying to figure out how to open them and then get to their classes on time and figure out which class to go to. That was not different this year for my in-person students. They still had to overcome all of those obstacles. In addition to the fact um, of wearing a mask while they did all of it, making sure they sanitized when they went into uh, each classroom and maintained social distancing. And so I've seen students overcome uh, the typical obstacles that come with a new school year, in addition to all the others that COVID have brought along. And uh, they've done it without complaint. They've done it without question. Uh, they have shown perseverance. Uh, and I'm just so amazed at um, how resilient they have um, um, come to be. They really have risen to the, to the occasion. So that's been great. Um, transitioning to VLO, that really does look different. Um, as we heard, it's, it's much more independent. Uh, students are working their way through, especially at the um, secondary level, the content at their own pace. And in doing so, um, they're developing their own schedule. They're finding ways that work for them as a learner to organize their materials, to organize their learning. Um, they're even learning how to communicate questions via a Canvas message or via Zoom, which is different. Um, and because this is different and new, it's not always perfect. And students are struggling with this from time to time, but I'm seeing them struggle and then push through those struggles and um, work to develop something uh, that works for them. For example, I had a student who shared each week on Monday, he writes down on a whiteboard his daily Zoom um, lessons for the week. I would have never thought of that strategy um, as a student, and I would have probably never suggested it, therefore, as a teacher, but the fact that he developed that on his own is just really cool to see. Um, and then I think this was discussed a little bit earlier as well, but I was really nervous about getting to know my students um, and making that connection with them through VLO and seeing their personality um, through the work with it being all online. Um, and I've seen their personality. I've seen their interests in the work they're doing. I had a student who um, created a video. The assignment didn't even call for a video. He requested, can I please make this video? And I said, of course. And when he um, created the video, he used a lightsaber as his uh, pointer in order to talk through the content we were learning. Uh, so that's just a perfect example of a student really taking something that they're interested in and running with it with their own creative twist and, um, and letting their personality shine through. So I've uh, been pleasantly surprised with how well I've been able to get to know my VLO students. That's good to hear. And, and I'm, I'm just curious, what part of your day is VLO and which part is in person? What's this point like for you? So um, I did draw kind of a lucky um, schedule in that regard. My day is chunked into two. So I spend my mornings until about lunchtime in person. And then I have two VLO classes that I teach. And so because of that in our block schedule, both days, odd and even days due to our block scheduling, I end my day with VLO. So that's been quite uh, nice for me just in terms of being able to kind of live in one world in the morning and then transition to the yeah. other world in the afternoon. Well, that, that, that can't be easy. So, I mean, thanks, thanks for doing all that. I mean, doing to, to make that flip and make that switch and, and to make it work from, from what it sounds like. So absolutely. Uh, what about, is there overlap between VLO and in-person? I mean, what can you pull from VLO? to in-person um, and if you have to make that shift, you know, eventually to remote, um, you know, what's, what's, how does that look from your lens since you've been in both? Yeah, absolutely. There definitely is overlap. Um, and I think it goes all the way back to the spring and the fact that teachers very quickly had to work to develop digital tools. And um, again, at the secondary level, use Canvas in order to guide uh, their daily instruction. Um, so through that process in the spring and then through VLO, these model courses that have been developed have really helped not just VLO teachers, but all teachers have a toolbox full of digital resources that can be used not only in the VLO setting, but also in person. And then that lends itself nicely as we're talking about students who might have to be quarantined for say 10, 14 days, whatever it might be. Um, a lot of those uh, digital resources can be utilized in in-person um, settings so that if a student is, uh, is quarantined, uh, there's a nice overlap there that is uh, beneficial. Um, in terms of preparing for 
remote learning 2.0, if, if that's the direction that we need to head. I think everything we've been doing all the way from back in the spring until now has just been a learning process, a work in progress. Teachers, um, and, and an, even not in a pandemic, collaborate and work together to best meet the needs of our students. And we're continuing to do that. Um, and as a result, we're working to make our uh, instruction and our Canvas pages as clear and consistent as possible. And so as we potentially make a transition or as we continue with what we're currently doing, I think all of these digital tools and the collaboration amongst teachers um, is, is beneficial. So there sounds like there's things that will pull forward once we come out of the, of the pandemic, hopefully sooner than later, but it sounds like yes. there's some things that we'll be able to, to carry forward. All right. Oh, Thank absolutely. You. Yep. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Uh, we're going to shift now to get a student perspective on what being in school is like this year in person learning. Destiny Jackson, senior at West. Thanks for being here. Can you talk a little bit about um, how school is different for you, for you now and what it looks like? Okay, of course. Um, I just want to let everyone know in the interest of time and just, you know, kind of my obsession with being able to know that I got everything said that I'm going to say. I wrote some things down, so if you see me glance down, that's what I'm looking at. Perfect. Um, so pretty much I said that with the accommodations that I've had to be arranged due to this untimely virus, school has definitely been difficult this year. Um, I know that I can't speak for the underclassmen, but as far as seniors go, um, I know that there has been a very frustrating realization that a lot of the events that we pour our passions into, whether it be sports or theater, um, anything in the arts, anything like that, have either been canceled or they're downplayed in some sense. Um, but of course, until we as a community can effectively work together in less than any amount of cases, then that won't be a possibility. Um, this virus, of course, is extremely deadly, and we do recognize the importance of having our peers as well as our families' best interests health-wise um, in the forefront of our minds. Um, as far as the daily basis goes, I definitely feel that our building is taking proper precautions when it comes to making sure that everyone is masked up and appropriate, um, making sure that we're sanitizing, dispersing groups, et cetera, everything like that. Um, I do feel that we could even go a step further with it and enforce something like daily temperature checks or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the larger issue is the groups that are formating outside of school ground and then continuing to come to school with obviously is out of our hands. Um, and that's just, you know, because of where is in winter. So yeah, that's what, that's what that's yeah, the, that's what we're seeing too. I mean, obviously this is all heavy for us and, and challenging in a lot of regards. And, and Destiny, you speak um, the truth from a student perspective. And so um, I think outside of school, it's been challenging when groups are getting together. It's a little bit more controlled environment in school. So uh, I didn't even ask you to say that, but, but you did. And um, that's sort of what you're, what you're um, having to deal with and what you see probably in your friends that are being quarantined and things like that. Um, or, or that might be a positive case. Um, from your perspective, um, what's probably the, been, been the best part of the school year for, for you this year? So as far as positives, um, I would say that COVID has definitely taught us to be appreciative, not only um, for our family, but for the moments that do allow us to get those high school experiences that we all yearn for and hear about. Um, in addition, I think our district has been very fortunate when it comes to moderating our agenda in a manner that permits us to still maintain in-person um, schooling, which is more than other schools can say, of course, um, which many of us are really appreciative for because I know that virtual learning can be difficult in the sense that maybe there's a loss of motivation or just depending on how you learn, maybe you need to be in person to be able to um, have things explained to you um, if you're an audible learner and things like that. Um, virtual, virtual learning can also be difficult, especially in high school. Yep, yep. And Destiny, what would you say is the biggest challenge to this school year? I mean, you, you addressed some of this early on, so 
I'm sorry if it's a repeat for you, but can you just tell us again what's been the most challenging part of your school year? Um, I think the challenges are just simply um, trying to navigate around the boundaries that kind of involve maintaining the safety within our hallways. Um, we're used to being able we're used to being able to socialize with our friends openly, and now we have to, um, you know, practice being conscious or not possibly and accidentally infect somebody else. Yeah. So I think that would be the largest challenge for sure. That, that's a that's a key part. That's a key part. I'm glad you brought that up too, Justin. I know we're going to talk a little bit um, later on about diversity, so I'll come back and, and talk to you about that, and we'll. Um, have Mr. Card part of that conversation too. So thanks for your, your part so far, and we'll come back to you in just a few minutes. Uh, the next uh, guest panelist is Mrs. Audrey Young, and she is at Freedom, and she's one of our guidance counselors. One of the key components of wanting to come back in person, not that we don't address it with DLO, because we certainly do, and Audrey's going to touch on that, is the social emotional learning piece. So first of all, Audrey, thanks for being here. Talk a little bit about the role at Freedom and, and maybe just all the Coda schools play in meeting those social emotional needs for our kids, both in person uh, during the pandemic and, and certainly with the VLO students as well. Well, social emotional learning is so important in any year, but specifically this year. And social emotional learning provides a foundation for students um, to have a positive learning experience. It enhances their ability to succeed in school um, and whatever career they choose and in life. And, you know, our district is becoming more uh, multilingual, uh, multicultural. We have different socioeconomic um, families that are coming in and out of our school. And I think it is so important that we partner with different agencies in our district to help our students have the most success in our school. Um, you know, relationships like Jameis said matter. And so making that connection so that you could move that child from A to B, um, putting this year specifically, anxiety is heightened, putting the student and teacher's wellness um, first and foremost. So how do we do that in a pandemic year? And so what we do is we try to provide social emotional learning in and out of our school day every day. And I know that um, one, of our, one of our programs that we've done that came through um, central office was E plus R equals O. You know, we teach our kids the event, pressure your response equals your outcome. And a lot of parents ask me, what it specifically is social emotional learning? And it's, we teach the children um, to learn about self-awareness, understanding who they are, understanding their emotions and why they make the decisions that they do. Um, we also talk about self-management, how can they regulate themselves and delay gratification? We also talk about social awareness, being aware of others, being aware of other cultures, um, and being able to, you know, appreciate one another for everybody's differences. And we also talk about relationship, positive relationships. How do you talk clearly? How are you being an active listener? And then responsible decision making and being able to think before you speak and being able to make a healthy choice for you and not give into peer pressure, but being true to yourself and making healthy choices. So in my opinion, I think social emotional learning is, is the foundation for all learning. Totally agree with that. And thanks for your work on that. And, and in schools, um, and I think it's been kind of a common theme since we started um, tonight at seven, that there's a lot of over overlap in people networking and talking. So um, what partnerships um, do you utilize or does the district utilize um, to support our kids? And well, staff, number, for that matter. the number one um, support and, and, and is Mind Peace, and we partner with Mind Peace, where you know every building should have a full time therapist. And you know, a lot of times, families 
don't understand what my role is versus what a clinical therapist is. And I, you know, my caseload is 650 students and my job is to do whole school activities. And though many of us counselors would love to see their child one-on-one, you know, for the whole year, you know, clinically, we don't, we, that's kind of out of our wheelhouse. And so if a student has deeper needs that need to be addressed, then what we do is we're the bridge to kind of make that happen for the family. And it's so healthy. And this year it has been, you know, a blessing for, um, for families. Another thing we partner with our Companions on a Journey, Companions on a Journey is a grief and bereavement group. Um, and, you know, we, we've had more deaths than normal. Um, during this COVID time. And so having a grief and bereavement group where they meet together, they form their own community um, and they're able to celebrate the life of a loved one, but also um, learn coping tools to deal with that death and how do I manage that and how do I keep moving forward? And that's really, really important. Um, We've done mentoring. Um, West High School, Bobby Emig and I were trying to work out how can we do mentoring virtually for our kids and have a buddy system. I've done a little bit of buddy system, you know, and with my school. We've also invited Girl Scouts in. Um, Circle Tail, Hope Squad is really important. And so those are uh, fundamental groups that help partner with us um, to help our kids be successful and, our, and give supports to our families. Yeah, that, that, that's big. One of the uh, groups you mentioned is Circle Tail and, and Freedom, where you're at, um, has one of our therapy dogs, Biggs, one day a week. So uh, what kind of difference do you see um, in the kids when, when the therapy dog, when Biggs is at Freedom? And well, attendance has, gone, attendance has gone up on Wednesdays because everybody wants to come in and see Biggs. And so they, they love Biggs. But, you know, therapy dogs, have many benefits. They have social, emotional learning benefits. They have cognitive benefits. They have physical benefits. They also have um, social benefits. And one thing that I've noticed is when I bring Biggs into a classroom and I always share that these classrooms, especially this year, you're a family and this is your Mm -hmm. family and you take after, you take care of your family. And so when they bring Biggs in, they all like get very excited, but I also ask them, make sure you pick up things off the floor so we can take care of our pet in this building. And so they come together, they unite and having a therapy dog in the building grows relationships, kids partner together. They want to help one another. And then they get to see their school counselor and their teachers acting like idiots because we're making these silly voices with the dog, but it makes a connection. And then they share about their pet or their experience. And so it has been wonderful. Um, Anxiety has been a huge issue this year. And I've had students come in my office and Biggs is there and they literally just sit with me on the floor with Biggs and they just pet him. And it's, it's a calming tool for them. Um, And so it is, it just offers, un, he offers unconditional love and a reduction of stress. And let me tell you something, our staff, I'm amazed at how much our staff has benefited because it has been a very stressful year for our staff and they want to keep the kids safe. They want to provide VLO in-person learning and Biggs just is that unconditional love that they can lean on at that time. Yeah, well said. Thank you. And it does help with the, with the adults and the dog because it has been such a hard year. Um, thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for sharing that. Uh, we are now going to shift a little bit on the topics and talk a little bit about LODI, um, our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, which is now headed by uh, Mr. Elgin Card. Um, Elgin, can you talk a little bit about uh, LODI, what the priorities are this year, when we talk about you know working with diversity and inclusion and providing more of a inclusive learning environment, there's your setup. And you're you are on mute. I got it now. I don't have very often, does it? Sure. Thank you all for being here. I think um, me being new to the Lodi team, um, I work very closely with Miss Aisha Moore and Miss Lee Aguilar. Um, some of the things we all want for our kids is for our kids to be feel apart, to be respected, 
uh, to have someone they feel comfortable with, regardless of their race or religion or, or social economic situation or special needs or um, sexual orientation or whatever. And, and that's something really working toward. Um, and as we do that, um, we're working with trying to make sure that our teachers um, understand some of those things even more in some training we're doing. We have a group that Miss Aisha Moore has been working with for four years, and I'm lucky to be with called our Champions for Change. And our Champions for Change are teachers, and there's at least one in every building. Some have up to four. Um, and they these champions are wonderful. They volunteer their time. Um, they're not getting paid for this. They know because it's best to make sure that everybody – is treated fairly, everybody feels respected, and they do the work in the buildings for the Lodi team uh, because we can't be in all 23 buildings all the time. And the biggest thing they've done is doing some uh, uh, mandatory trainings uh, with our staffs to make sure they understand some of the needs of our kids from different cultures or different backgrounds. And that has been very, um, it's been very challenging because there's some tough conversations, but it's been very rewarding too because I think uh, through tough conversations comes growth. And I think we're, we're getting there and we're working on that. We have more to do and we're going to continue to work on that as we move forward. Um, also, another piece, uh, I know I have been working, I've been very lucky to start up um, diversity and inclusion student groups in the 712 buildings. And I've met with about half of them at this point. Uh, and what did we hear from our students and these two great students on the call today are, is so powerful. And what continually comes out in my messaging uh, uh, what I hear from these students is within curriculum, and Mr. Coney and I have talked about this, our kids want to learn about different things, different cultures. They want to do things of that nature from different backgrounds. And, and what I hear is we want to hear, we want to read books from different people and different backgrounds and different views. And we want to learn more. Um, one meeting I had at, uh, at West the other day and then I had East Tuesday, West Wednesday, both things came out is we've learned the same stuff for since fourth grade. Can we learn some different viewpoints? So we're working on some things like that to make sure um, because the kids voice is the most powerful. Um, I can say whatever I want to say and, and you can look at me, but if it comes from our kids, um, you know, it's real because they're, they're the ones there doing it and how they feel. I think another very, very large um, uh, thing I hear from our students is they want to have some diversity within our staff, some more diversity within our staff. That is something that Lodi, along with HR, is working on. It, it's a big lift. I understand that. But uh, I know we're starting to work on some recruiting and doing some things. But the bottom line, what I tell the kids is representation does matter, and they understand that. But we got to make sure we have the bright representation. We want the best people for our kids at Lakota. So um, just listening to those kids uh, is so wonderful. Um, I have to go to West Freshman tomorrow for my meeting. Uh, and I got each freshman this week as well. So I really look forward to that. So those are some of the major things we're looking at um, quickly uh, with Lodi. And, uh, you know, always, always want to give our champions a shout out because the work they do in our buildings is, is unmatched. Yep. And it's hard sometimes. I mean, it's hard uh, with different viewpoints and it's hard sometimes with the adults uh, than the kids. But one of the things that I love that you're doing, Elgin, is the student groups. And you kind of talked about that before. Um, and you might want to pull Destiny into this part of the conversation or part of the conversation coming up. But um, can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing? I know you, you talked about East and West and you're going to the freshman buildings coming up. But can you talk about um, why the groups were created and what kind of things you're doing with them so far and what you're, what you're thinking long term? Yeah, I think the groups were created just for that student voice. As I said, it's so important to hear from them. Uh, Miss Destiny uh, was one of my students at West when I was principal. And we were very close and had a good relationship. And she's one that wasn't afraid to say what she wanted to say. And that's what I want out of my student groups. I, I, I said, don't candy coat it for me because I'm going to take it back to Mr. Miller and Mr. Vogelman and others and tell them what you're saying. So I think moving forward, um, our, our, and we're really empty of this, but I know some of the students have already mentioned when, when we post COVID, once we start working, you know, what I heard what I ask the students, I asked them, tell me one positive thing or more about their building and their district and, and one thing and these improved. And boy, they had a lot of great stuff on both ends. And I'm putting all that data together. One thing that some of the students said is um, once we get things going here, and I'm at the junior highs as well, but we want to go down to the lower, the, 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 the lower grades and take some of the high school kids, maybe junior high, but high school kids probably down there. Because the kids tell me 
that's where change starts when you're mm-hmm. small. You know, we, we, we're older. We, we, we can still make change. But if we can uh, make the younger kids understand this and get them involved, it'll make a big difference. So one of the best things I want to do uh, w- w- when we can go out to buildings is take the kids down there with our younger kids because we always know when you're in elementary school, you really look up those high school kids in your, in, in your school and, and they'll, you'll listen. And I think it'll just cause growth at a lower at a younger age. So when these kids come up and they're in my group, uh, they'll understand what's going on and they'll take it back down and, and, and we just pay it forward that way. And, you, and you've got role modeling going on at the, at the younger grades. And so I think that's important. And you talk about representation and that's important. Um, let, let's pull Destiny back in. Uh, a little bit and just from her perspective talk a little bit destiny can you talk a little bit about why student diversity groups are important so um i said that as minorities we are living in a predominantly white area so um we are very much experiencing discrimination and microaggression already on a daily basis and we don't need to experience those things as well throughout the halls of our school. Um, Diversity groups, I think, would let us know that you genuinely acknowledge and um, appreciate us as students. I also believe that it would allow us to ensure that minority students in this district will be met with equal opportunities both during and after high school. and provide us with a safe space to share testimony and for us to practice hearing and understanding each other's battles. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I'll go back to, to Elgin. Um, Elgin, what would you say as we're sort of winding up here, uh, what's the best way we can support our, our students with um, diversity and, and their needs? How do we yes. best? best do that. Listen, listen to what they say and what they're going through and, and uh, understanding different viewpoints. Uh, sometimes we run into, uh, as adults, we're not very good at listening. We run into, we think we know, but understand everybody's the way they are because of their experiences. My experience is different than yours and your experience is different than Destiny's and so forth. So just listening and trying to understand somewhat experience is the best way to do that to start. If, and, and we're doing it. We're doing it. One of the most things I'm proud of so far in a few months in this job is people are listening and people are talking and people are reading. And if they don't agree with certain things, they call and ask or we have conversations about it. And that's just that's the way it has, it has to start that way. We cannot just say, no, here's the way it is. You don't know that because you don't know that kid or that adult experience. So listen and, and then talk through it. And, and you know, we, we can get a lot of times where we're at now, where people want to go back and forth in a negative way. Um, my department's not going to let that happen as far as whether it comes to kids or staff. Uh, we're going to do it in a positive way and try to understand uh, everybody's needs and everybody's wants and everybody's experiences. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things, too, and it you know, comes out when we're talking about diversity, but it also comes out when we're talking about social-emotional learning, and it also comes out when we're talking about PLO or in person, this is a work in progress. And so uh, there are a lot of moving parts all the time um, to an education system for our kids and and for the adults, but certainly this year uh, has brought about more challenges. So, um, you know, we we are not perfect by any stretch, um, but we try to get better every single day in in as many aspects as we can. And so um, I'm going to wrap up here because I know we've gone over time by almost 15 minutes so if you've hung in there uh this long i hope you give me about 30 more seconds to to thank you um i want to sincerely thank the panel what a a a group of uh, it's an overused term but tonight it's it's true of rock stars who um share what's going on and and you know this wasn't all uh sunshine and butterflies we certainly have um things that are concerning that are wearing on all of us and so um, it's good to get that perspective too, as we're trying to build um, everything out for our kids and, and for our, our staff and for our community. And I wanna go back and how I started and say, um, thank you, thanks for being here, but also thanks to um, our teachers, our staff, our principals, our guidance counselors, other administrators, certainly our school nurses, 
um, deserve a, deserve a shout out for everything that they've been going through and um, adding on to the plates with COVID response teams and, and things like that. So again, we are not um, unique in terms of dealing with these challenges uh, with this pandemic and, and um, um, we're trying, we're trying to get better and do the best that we can for our kids. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for being here uh, for your continued support of Lakota schools uh, on behalf of the board of education. Um, I do want to uh, mention that, uh, that they reached out to me and asked if I would wish everybody a happy holiday on, the, on their behalf uh, as we roll into the winter season here coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So I uh, hope you uh, continue to, Everyone stay healthy as much as you can and, and take care of each other as we move through this. And uh, thank you for giving almost an hour of your time tonight to talk about Lakota schools and the state of the schools this evening. So thank you. And with that, uh, we'll be in touch again really soon. Thanks for our panel and good night.